is either in, on the dance floor, in the middle of the dance floor, where there's not many security guards at all, or in the cubicles where you do get security guards, but like, if you do it in between, like the sort of toilet shift, you can get away with it. Who's this? Duffy Duck. And no taste. Didn't taste too bad, not really, considering the shit that's in them. How many do you have? Uh, it's my third that is tonight now. When you're like, first coming up on a knee, there's a lot of the intense feelings that you get on it, there's a lot of the rush as it is known. It's like, remember when you, like, you're a little kid and it's the night before Christmas and you got, you're really excited and you've got that feeling in your stomach and you're all like, oh, I'm really hyped off and you can't stop running around. It's like that, but it's sort of like mixed with the first time you kiss your new girlfriend, that kind of feeling. The first time you kiss your new girlfriend and being excited as a kid and just loving everybody and all your emotions are really like accelerated and really like at the limits of the most you can like, be in any one emotion. The, the empathy you, you feel between somebody else who's had the same drug is absolutely, it's just, it is uplifting. Ecstasy, by its chemical compound, by its nature, seems to calm people down. They become very loving and very caring of each other. But it's false. It's false. It's, it derives from chemical. You know, it, it's not true. You know why they are like that. It's, it ruins it. Dance culture and drugs culture in turn have had a massive effect on society in the sense of it, it's affected media, it's affected fashion. This generation has got a totally different outlook. The powers that be are people that probably haven't taken ecstasy. You know, they probably haven't, but this generation that's coming in has taken drugs, has taken E, and so, yeah, you're going to sit in effect. The reality at the moment is we have a huge uncontrolled clinical trial going on there. The ecstasy we know has an effect on brain chemistry. Um, we don't know whether that effect is the same in humans as it is in animals. We don't know whether the effects are reversible or not. Um, if they're not reversible, we might have a whole generation of youngsters who have some chemical changes to their brain, the consequences of which we don't understand. And of course the worry is the sheer numbers. There are hundreds of thousands or millions of youngsters being exposed to these compounds. It is 10 years since MDMA, better known as ecstasy, hit Britain. Half a million people take it every week. But it hasn't just changed their lives, it's affected all our lives. signs of both dance culture, drug usage, and that whole kind of scene that goes with it is kind of, it's visible if you know about it, but it's invisible if you don't know about it. When you get out onto the street, and you get into the young person's world, you kind of begin to see the clear effect of dance culture and the trends that dance culture is driving. Um, and you can see it particularly in advertising where you've got sort of imagery that has to now reflect the young person's world. Looking at the uh, Jolly Rancher ad, it's kind of clearly depicting a sweet on the tongue, which is, you know, could be construed as a metaphor for sort of a pill on the tongue. You've also got the strap liner now available over the counter, which implies a nod and a wink to drug culture. Red Bull, you've got kind of eyes being held open by cans, simulating the effect of kind of staying up all night, the effect of giving you an energy boost, linking it to kind of club culture in terms of wanting to stay up dancing all night. The watchers of Switzerland there, you've got sort of a, a bishop sort of smoking a joint. 
what's interesting is that 10 years ago it probably would have been a cigarette and that would have been quite shocking. Time Out is about going out. What Time Out have tried to do is, is sort of reflect that with the people that they've used in their ads. Um, if you look at the girl who sort of looks like she's just taken ecstasy and she's kind of just come out of a club because her eyes are bulging, she's sweating, she's just had a long stint on the dance floor somewhere. when you come into it but it's such you know nice little areas in it you've got so many different stairwells and little passages and so on so you've got so much to decorate really but every single area has got something interesting in it at the dance floor you've got all the lights and lasers as amongst of all the drapes and all the hangings as you can see got two bars that's the main back bar here uh, main fire exit here and as we go through to the main bar he's just setting up the rest of the lights there and uh, through here is the DJ box. We're just setting this up for tonight, as you can see. Um, the Technics, got the 1210s, rain mixer, CD player. It's all the lighting rig. Drugs have changed the dance floors. I mean, I don't really remember like, the good old days back in 88, 89. I was probably still at school, so I've only really ever known it how it is. So I've ever only really known it as good as it is now. But I mean, the element, what we've got down here, of course it goes on. It does go on and it goes on, it's quite hard to stop. Um, you do do your best, but you do realise that people are going to do what they're going to do, because they're their own person. What about outside the restaurant? On the estate where I grew up, I mean, I was always hated, you know. I had to, like, leave to go to work or leave to go out at night and be like, oh, faggot, faggot, I was home. And a couple of years later, I'd see these people out at clubs that are totally off their heads on E, and they'd be so nice, they were like, arms around you, oh, you're fat Tony, you're, you're, you're all right, you're, even though you're queer, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was the same people that thrown bricks at me before they started taking drugs. Suddenly they're taking drugs and they're now, you know, related to me. The first time I'd ever been hit in a club was by this guy who came over and headbutted me. And uh, I was like, oh my God, I've been hit. And suddenly this big ruck went off. And the next time I did go out, this boy comes up to me, so off his head on E. I was like, oh, I headbutted you. <laughs> At future, I'm really sorry. And I was like, hang on, what, you're really sorry? That's all you can say, you know? It was like, oh, you know, I didn't mean to. I was like, well, why did you do it? And he was like, oh, because you're queer and all that, and I was like, oh, so it's a good enough excuse to go and headbutt someone. It's like, but I'm not like that anymore, I've changed, I'm so much nicer. I was like, why, because you're suddenly on, on E instead of Co. Anyway, three years down the line, I slept with him. I had an affair with him for about three months. No, thanks, Ecstasy. What would this place be like if no one ever brought a tablet in? Well, there's a lot of energy in this place anyway. There's like, um, it's not just about, I mean, people, some people do take drugs and some people don't take drugs. But whatever happens, the visuals, the lights, the music, it's stimulating. Would it really, really be the same club if there was no one ever did any ecstasy? Would it be the same? Um, to tell you the truth, I don't really know. There's still as many people doing E in clubs at the moment as there have been for the last four to five years, maybe even more. The track that I've got at the moment called On E starts off with Richard Jobson doing a, like, a news report. I play that and the whole place erupts. People who 
first discover ecstasy, I've got this opinion that if everyone else would just take a pill, well, the world would be a better place. I mean, I was that. I felt that. I just used to think, please, everyone take a pill, politicians, everybody, and we'll, we'll all be sorted. I think people who get into ecstasy really get into it. I mean, take it, huge amounts of it, huge amounts of the drug, because they love it. They, they think they've come home. You know, it's this amazing feeling. My job entails going out and doing research projects for our clients, companies such as Levi's, advertising agencies such as Grey. The, the most recent project was um, Young People and Drugs, where we were looking at the effects of drugs on youth culture and the normalisation of drugs into youth culture. Do you think that ecstasy is, has an effect on youth culture or drugs as such? Has it? Yeah, it's the, In it's, what way? I mean, well, because everyone, everyone does it now. Right. And so basically it's like accepted. It's not even like a drug anymore, is it? It's like beer. Do you reckon you get this time, this sort of honeymoon period when you first oh, discover God, it? Yeah, yeah. 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 there's like nothing else. You just like, you never take anything else like it. It's like a, it's like a novelty. First three months, it's like you escape from reality, it's like mad. You, all you look forward to is going out and doing these. MDMA is, is, is almost a unique compound. Um, there are very few other compounds, if any, which have the effect that MDMA has. It actually makes people like each other. It, it, it really does have a measurable effect on the relationship between people. And I think that's why it's so popular, that's why it's used. And I think all of the whole dance drug scene has denied uh, legitimate medicine the use of, of perhaps quite a useful drug. The dance industry barely existed a decade ago. Now British people spend about £2 billion a year going clubbing. That's five times more than on going to the cinema. There's more people employed in my industry now than there ever was before. It looks like it's here to stay, and so there's respectable, gainful employment to be got from this industry, and taxes to be paid. One of our clients is a brewery company and they have realised that they have to acknowledge dance culture just purely because it's changed things like people's alcohol consumption. Because obviously if people are going to go out and take E or Speed, they're not going to drink alcohol, they're going to drink water or they're going to drink soft drinks. Alco pops, for a start, are, are, are definitely something that would come out of of dance culture or the club scene. You know, here, here's a soft drink, but it's also got a hit because people obviously take drugs for the hits. It's blatantly obvious, I think, why our co-pops came around because they were losing market share, you know, selling beers. Clubs now close at 6 a.m. in the morning on average. And, um, you know, London in particularly is a 24-hour city. And you've got the area of, of, of Soho, um, Old Compton Street. It's wonderful to see uh, people chilling out and enjoying themselves for the after hours. You have now got cafe culture. I wonder would that have happened 10 years ago without the advent of dance music? I think probably not. Since the whole dance scene and culture has taken off, petrol stations must think what on earth has happened. They suddenly had these, these hordes of clubbers going in to buy chewing gum, Rizzlers, probably a bottle of water. If you haven't taken ecstasy, it's hard to describe why you get that feeling, but you, do, you, you get this kind of urge to kind of chew, and so that, that's why you have chewing gum.
It's a very close synergy between drug and kind of the rave and the dance scene. I doubt very much whether one would really have had the profile without the other. Has there ever been a time when such a massive number of people in this country have taken Class A drugs? No, would be the short answer to that. Uh, and in terms of the amount of ecstasy in circulation, Britain probably leads the world. We may well have per head of population the most users. We certainly have the most deaths. Ecstasy is a Class A drug like LSD and heroin. But the threat of a criminal record does not stop most people taking E, according to a survey in Mixmag, the Clubbers magazine. But half did say a bad experience would make them give it up. You can take loads of it over, say, a six-month period, constantly, every weekend. Just kind of, from a health point of view, you start looking shitty. You lose lots of weight and, and spotty and just unhealthy. Of course, there are, you know, there's side effects and the side effects we don't know about, you know, which is another story. Well, how about bad experiences? Have you ever had any bad experiences with D? Yeah, yes, I got some, um, I was in this club one night, and I just lost control of myself completely. I was just like shaking constantly all night. I was up against this wall for, I don't know, it seemed like hours. Everyone was looking at me, I was just twitching. I just didn't know what I was doing. You have your first bad E, you know, your first bad experience, and that, like anything, you know, you feel like you've been slapped in the face by a good friend. One guy said everyone's always giving up E when they've had a bad one, you know, and it is true. People give it up when they've had a bad one, but they still go back to it. They're always, you're always chasing that first, that first high, you know, that you had, that first, oh, that feeling, you're always chasing that. And so it makes you cynical, it does, maybe. Anyway. Hello, mate. How you doing? Where are you? You at home? What colour were you looking for? The black guy. He's not working at the moment, but the round girl is the white one. The unique yeah. selling point about the way I do things is that I deliver. I use a mobile phone because you have to be available when people want them, and that's when they want to enjoy themselves. The phone's probably um, the equivalent of oxygen in this game. Without one, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to operate successfully. Cheers. Do you know anyone else? The ecstasy industry is controlled by organised crime, but the drug is filtered down to the average user by small-scale dealers. I started dealing in 1990, and I was only selling hash, and that was just the people that I know purely to sort of support my own habit, if you like. 1991, I suppose, is when the... the I couldn't suppress the demand for ease. People were asking for so often, it was stupid not to sell them. Because invariably, if you didn't have the ease along with whatever else they wanted, they didn't want the other. Ease became the number one thing that they actually wanted, and everything else was byproducts. It's a sort of supermarket attitude, if you like. You've got to stock everything that they want so they can do the one stop shop. That's what they wanted for a service. The two key questions when you're talking about ecstasy use in the UK is how many people are using it and how much are they taking? Well, the Henley Forecasting Centre estimated that roughly a million people a week are going clubbing. Possibly half of them are going to be uh, regular or occasional users of ecstasy. Now, across 1994-95, police customs seized about three to four million tablets of ecstasy. Now, their best guess that the amount of ecstasy that they seize is about 10%. So you could say that there might be 30 to 40 million doses of ecstasy, and that may well be a conservative estimate. Hello? Oh, hello? Yeah, the apart's top actually, you've got a policeman in front of me. The average yeah. ecstasy pill at source would probably cost pence per hundred, not each, but about for a hundred pills, it cost you a few pence to make if you're on a, a major scale. There are a number of manufacturers, there's less than 30. 
And of those 30, I would suppose about probably four, to my mind now, are what I would call major players. They dominate the market. Most ecstasy pills that I know about in England do come from Europe. Reason being that it's, uh, it's much easier to get the products that you need to make ecstasy pills in those countries. A lot of the people that manufacture them over there are UK based and the end product is easier to get into this country because it's been smuggled. Have I been to a manufacturer's manufacturing plant? Yes, I've been into one. The workspace was probably about 80 feet by 80 feet. It was not a huge place, but it was, it was actually crammed, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, with orders that are ready to go out, but yet, you say, as they call them the printing presses, they weren't stopping actually making pills. It, it, was a, it was an ongoing thing, and you just couldn't make them fast enough. Many people start taking E when they are under 18. A survey reported in 1990 that awareness of drugs in the 14 to 16 age group had quadrupled in a single year. The trend has continued ever since. We've come out today onto the camera to talk to young people about what they get up to in their spare time. The reason we do it on camera is so that we can take it to our clients and they get a real feel for what these people are like. We went to Carnaby Street because it's a place where lots of young people hang out and we were there during school holidays so the kids were out from school. Um, and basically I just approached people and asked them if they'd be prepared to talk to me about drugs. It's how old were yeah. you when you took acid? I was about 14 when I got acid first, I think, yeah. Have you, have you done it much since then? Yeah. <laughs> lots? Yeah. Well, how, I mean, how often would you say that you take acid? I don't know. Um, I used to do it quite a lot. I don't do it so much anymore. Can you tell me what would be a typical weekend? Um, probably Friday night, just go out, get really stoned, and then Saturday probably go out to a club, pop a couple of pills or do some whiz or something. How important are drugs to you? Well, to me now, I don't know about Danny, but to me, I've stopped taking these. I've been off these now for like about six months. I think this country is full of paranoid young people, basically. Because when you get in a club now, like people are all like, like they don't even feel like they're good enough to talk to you unless they're there on a knee. I've been doing it for six years, and I, it's just like it's like an everyday thing. It's like getting up and like brushing your teeth. Like I, I can't go to a rave and not really have anything. Same as like an alcoholic can't go to a pub and not have a drink. Yeah, how, I mean, how would you compare drugs to alcohol? Um, a lot better and a lot, a lot safer because when when you're pissed, I mean, you can go and like punch a crap out of someone. If you're stoned or or something, you're not, you're not exactly going to have the energy. But when you're pilling or speeding, you're, you're too happy. The really young children do surprise me because it's obviously because dance music and the whole dance culture is getting much bigger now. People are getting in, into it from a much younger age, and so that that does surprise me when you get 13, 14 year olds taking drugs. It's interesting to think why youngsters find ecstasy so attractive. Uh, perhaps it's just a combination of producers producing the compound in large quantities, packaging it appropriately, the developments and the dance scene and a whole variety of factors just coming together uh, at a time, at the same time, and, and uh, then the whole thing takes off. Perhaps one of the reasons is because the clubs are marketing it effectively, that they are a very, very important in the way that ecstasy is distributed. And they provide a focus to buy it and to consume it. The half a million people who take ecstasy every weekend are all breaking the law. The maximum sentence for possession is seven years. Maximum sentence for supplying Class A drugs is life imprisonment. Suppliers can be professional dealers, but they can also be people who pass on pills to their friends without making a profit. My name's Scott, I'm a French engineer. It's a job I really enjoy, I absolutely love it. And I'm a raver. I have been a raver for like about a year now. I've never been before, but I've seen the video. The jungle, the jungle, the best thing about it. The jungle, the atmosphere, everything. The atmosphere, the jungle, everything. 
I do because it's just a good buzz. It's absolutely amazing something I've never experienced in any other like scene that I've been involved in. I'm gonna go with Hell Scatter. I'm gonna take some drugs and then I'm gonna fucking dance all night and have a madden. Oh shit. Um, I'm afraid it's just all broken off into powder in my hand. You've got an event here which we are which we are policing. Uh, it's it's it's, it's the drug culture where where they go in, they take the drugs. When we arrest them, they they openly admit that it's a rave and and they're taking their their ease. Standard dove, I'm afraid. Unfortunately, I was only managed to get one for tonight, off like a friend of mine. But um, usually I take, do take more than that. But there weren't that many about we'll for tonight. But I should be able to get more in there. There's usually like people offering them round actually inside the venue, so I should be able to get sorted. And hopefully I'll have an excellent night. How many would you take tonight? Ooh, probably four tonight, I reckon. That's what I want to try for, anyway. We are policing it. We, we, are, we are seen to be policing it. And, and the question is, OK, so... Uh, by policing it openly and walking around openly, knowing very well that these people are taking drugs, um, what kind of message we are we giving? Uh, what is the message, then? I don't know. Uh, are we accepting it? Uh, I don't know. But is that what it means? No, it doesn't. We were trying to do our best. We were trying to police it. Um, but at the same time, we know what is happening, and there is very little we can do. I mean, what you see now is the tip of the iceberg. It's not really a problem like getting drugs into the place. You just conceal it somewhere in your body where they're not likely to search, like in your shoes or in my underwear. All right, thank you very much. Cheers. The atmosphere that the dance music culture, like braving, manages to generate is absolutely shocking, it really is. The, the moment you walk into like an, an event, an arena, you can just feel it in the air. There's like a feeling of like, I don't know, something's alive, there's something alive somewhere in the room and it's like the music, you can hear the music pulsing out and all the people responding to the music and the MCs or whatever. And it's, it's just like a really amazing buzz. It's like you can feel the air around you, there's all this like happiness and smiling faces and people jumping about all over the place just enjoying themselves and letting their air down and doing what they want to do just for like one night. It's one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had. Everybody's all just like loved up. You go to a rave with 6,000 strangers and like halfway through the night there's 6,000 of your best mates. Tell me how you're feeling Scott. I'm a failure, I'm feeling fucking amazing. <laughs> I managed to get myself some eight pills since I got in here. Now I'm absolutely just fucking flying. I'm having a banging night. Can't get a fucking enough of it. Can't fucking what, what, keep still, though. I don't know what I'm talking about. What a night, man. What a night. Helter Skelter. I fucking love it. But before I took my first eat, I would, I'd ask people, you know, I was going around to them and saying, um, you know, what does it do? And people were trying to tell me the experiences you have on it. But nothing they said could have prepared me for like that, oof, God, I love you, you're my best mate, and all that. I didn't expect any of that. Even though people had said, you know, you love each other, I had my, like, my own perceptions of what that would feel like, but when it actually happened, I was like, oh, my God, I really do love you of your ace. And it, was, it really was a, a, an experience which changed my life. For the better, I'd say. Tell us what's going on in your head. What's going on in my head? I just fucking love everybody I do. I just want to go around, like, meeting people and shaking people's hands. And, put... and hugging people and stuff. I'm a baby. It's false. It derives from chemical, you know, it, it's not true. You know why they are like that. It's, it ruins it. It gives me no pleasure at all. Someone's just got a shotgun here, yeah. blowing my brains out without killing me yet, and it's left me fucking completely trashed. And it's wicked. Like it, nice and it's it's mm -hmm. absolutely fucking brilliant. It is the balance. Oh, it starts off in your head. You know, my head started going tingling. My eyes started to roll. Fucking had to sit down. I couldn't stand up to start I was just like, oh my god, what the fuck's going on here? And then all, all of a sudden, I was like, it was all right again. And I, like, I was off and I was like, oh, I'm running around. I couldn't stop dancing. I've seen public order trouble from people who drink alcohol, and it's more difficult to police them than to police the, the, the sanctuary. It's less hard work for us, but you're standing there and you know why they are like that. And you know because they've taken a Class A drug. It doesn't mean anything? No, it doesn't. Absolutely not. And any officer who says to you, well, this, it's much better to police people who are taking Class A drugs than, than drunkards uh, are looking for an easy life, is 
I, to me, it's worse. <laughs> I think it's an important part of my job um, to make sure as far as I possibly can that I kind of stay in touch with what's happening uh, on the drug scene. What kind of, what kind of drugs do you do? Ecstasy, and amphetamines, and speed, known as weed. Very, very, very good drug, very, very enjoyable. Nobody do your so you can come to a place like this and have a good night without doing it. Yeah. Yeah. What are you taking tonight? Um, what have I taken? Mm. I haven't taken much at the moment. I'll take uh, a gram and drop two pills in one. Right. Well, I eat that. I just want to say that I think the dance culture is actually about dancing and not about ecstasy and not about all these useless drugs that people think it's about. I just want to say I came here to have a wicked time and I have. And I might have done drugs, but that's not the point. I came here to dance. What ecstasy may have done, because a lot of people take it and, you know, let's be honest, see around them other people taking it and not coming to a great deal of harm, if harm at all, the ecstasy may have been a kind of catalyst drug that has raised the level of acceptability of drug use in general, uh, including LSD and amphetamine. And it may have been that so the ecstasy kind of created a sort of platform of acceptability. I've seen kids, I've seen youngsters of 17, 18, looking absolutely dreadful with tubes all over the place. And I, I don't want to dramatize it. I don't want to, uh, you know, it's, it's not in my place to do, but I've seen it. And as a human being, you can't help but think, what is it for? What for? We've all, we've all partied, we've all enjoyed ourselves. But why? Is it, is it really worth it? You know, it, it, it frightens me and it saddens me. They've, they've caught somebody who's suspected of dealing with drugs, and the reason they, they thought they suspected of dealing with drugs purely and simply is the number of, of drugs he's got on him. See how they treat you. See how they treat you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're not getting held in this position. You stand still. All right, well, let go of me then. Let go of me. I'll tell you. I don't agree to be on telly, all right? Get camera out. He was um, seen by security officers counting a lot of money. Alicia, I've got your 500 pound here. As he was being searched, they've noticed in his hand that he had uh, bags of white tablets, which is really excessive. Get the key. Before, before you put him in the van, just check the van. I'll even give you directions. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Where is your car? Hang on, before you go, where is your car? It's just like down that road there, and then take a left. Show the van, sir. Oh. I'll come up there. I'll we'll try and get a lift up there. So she knows where the car is. Right? What? If if somebody go with yeah, her to the car park just down here. Yeah, I will. I've known people go for five, six, seven years for unlawful possession with intent to supply. Right. But I cannot possibly feel sorry for somebody who's, who's selling drugs 
to cause death. I have been to the local hospital several times and attending to people, feeling sorry does not, does not come into it at all to the country. Uh, I want to see that person banged up for a long, long time. Been dropped? Sure, yeah. Okay. Just before he goes. Yeah, what you're witnessing here is a frame-up, anyway. Why? Why? Because I had, I had money, and because I had money, they want my money. And because I won't give them my money, they, they decide to take my drugs. Stay with me they decide to take my money. She's a 19 year old, um, she was purely in possession of a small quantity of a controlled drug. Can you tell me why you're here? Because I'm caught with drugs. You're caught with drugs, okay. Now you've come down here to attend uh, a raid, a party, call it what you will. Okay, and whilst you're in there, you were found in possession of uh, a small quantity of a controlled drug, aren't you? Why did you have the drugs with you? Just so good. For fun. Sorry? For fun. You're going to have it for fun. And I've also taken into consideration the fact that you haven't been in trouble with the police before. You have no convictions for any drugs related offences whatsoever. And because of that, I'm going to administer a caution. We're kind of accepting it now when I say we, not the police, that this culture, they're accepting that. That's the thing to do. Does that annoy you? It, it doesn't. Does it, does it disappoint you? It, it disheartens me because, because we are talking about bright, young, bright people with a bright future. It frightens me. Okay, and there is a proviso at the bottom which I'd like you to read and sign. Of course you've got the you've got the one who takes it one day goes to for a rave. It'll be naive of me or, or alarmist of me to say, well, everybody's a criminal. Yeah. And then everybody go on burglary, but there's a large majority who goes um, burgle and break into cars to get money to buy to buy these drugs. They're expensive. What would you say to someone that said you must be doing crime to come out like this? I'd say it's not true because I don't do any crime. Well, the only crime I do is taking drugs and having them on me, like you know, before I take them. I don't like go out robbing people and stuff like that to pay for a lot of my drugs. I go out and earn it like anybody else does. What happened with your friends tonight, you know, for each of them? I haven't got a clue, I just saw any of them all night, just every now and then, we just like passed each other. There's a, one of our mates, Collie, he like, went on a mad paranoid trip about, I don't know what about, he just stood out in the rain all night long. How are you shot? doing, you all right there? Yeah? All right, man. How was your evening? It's all right, not too bad. You've been standing out here for a while, like, getting very wet, haven't you? I have. But, I don't that? mind. It's all right, getting wet, I suppose. You have a shower, don't you? Why are you standing out here? I don't know, just one of them things that you do, isn't it? Just stand in the rain. I ended up doing four E's and half gram of whiz. I'm fitting myself out. I had an absolutely excellent night with it. It's absolutely wicked. It's different anyway with like you two being there and that. It's absolutely just the moment. I met loads of people and what before like I started to feel ill I was well like loved up just going around meeting people and shaking their hands and hugging people and stuff like that. I was having like real good. But then it all went when I started to feel ill and I had to stop then and just sit down on the what side. Did you put it down to? Uh, I was a bit ill before I came out anyway, when I like this morning I had like bad stomach and I felt like I was gonna be sick. And then it doesn't help my stomach, does it, by going and shoving chemicals into it all night long. There's nothing been proved yet, as other like, of what damages it can do to your body. 
and stuff like that. But some of the, like the theories I've been put forward, like your brain cells have been killed off and then grown back in a deformed way and stuff, that really, like, really bothers me. That does. Just, but it doesn't bother me enough to like stop me taking them. I suppose. If you knew, if there was proof that it definitely damaged your brain, would you stop taking them? No, I don't think I do. Because at the end of the day, you're dead anyway, aren't you? I could like take ease all my life and then die, or I could not take ease all my life and then die. At the end of the day, you're going to die anyway, so that's why I look at it anyway. But let's not forget that the fundamental thing is alcohol is, is legal and ease isn't. And, and let's never, ever lose a sight of that. See, it's no good justifying, saying, well, you, you've got hundreds of people who take ease and nothing happens to them, and, and, and you've got people who are alcoholic and what have you, still remains the fact that one is legal, one is illegal. Simulator at the last hour scout when I was coming off on a pill. And when I got off, I couldn't walk, my legs were all shaky, and I was like, oh my god, I just had to sit down and just wait for like, that bit of it to pass. Uh, about a year or so ago, you know, it, it was obvious Scott, he was changing, he was getting into the rave scene. I started going to a club in Leicester called By Heart. He used to go there every week, and there was always rave music banging out of his speak as opposed to heavy metal. I, I, I do know what's going on, you know, and uh, it's pretty obvious if he was going rave and he was taking pills. I always was totally open with Scott and me and my wife have always said to Scott, if you get to the stage where you want to experiment with drugs, consult us because we can guide you along the right lines. You can help your kids and your kids can trust you much better if you're totally honest with one another. If we know what's going on, when you know he needs help, we can help. If you don't know what's going on, if you don't know what your kids are up to, how can you help them? With acid, particularly back in the 60s, you took acid then and you went on a trip. And it wasn't a communal kind of um, sharing experience, although you probably did it with other people who were doing the same. But you all went your own separate ways in your minds kind of thing. But with ease, you don't do that. You know, you, you feel good, you feel like you want to be with people and you want to be with people who are your friends. I've done about four or five, which isn't a great deal, but I've tried them. I, I mean, I don't go raving or anything, but I sit in the lounge with my stereo on, and I just feel bloody nice, you know. And uh, people come round to see Scott, and people come round to see me. I'm so glad to see people, and my friends are... They just seem more of a friend than I've ever seen, and my family, you know, I love them more than I could, I've ever loved them, you know, and I've always loved them loads anyway, and I just feel bloody nicer with them. Right. So we've got 35 here, in one bag. And just one bag of green vegetable matter. Yeah, and one bag of green vegetable matter. What will happen with the pills now? They will be, they will be taken and put in what we call drug property, uh, and they will be sent to laboratory for it to be analysed and that will be given an evidence against the person in a court of law. When we receive a, a tablet from the police to identify a tablet that's suspected of being ecstasy, what we actually do is, is to measure its size, we'll weigh it, we'll, we'll uh, describe its physical characteristics. It's round, it's... 8.54 millimetres. We uh, enter the information into the Tic Tac database, which will then retrieve products which match that description, and then we'll see pictures which we can decide whether they match the unknown tablet or not. And there are two products in the system which match that description. Uh, the first one contains amphetamine, and the second one contains MDMA. 
one of the difficulties with ecstasy is, is being the media. The, the media has hyped up the importance of deaths and, and in youngsters' minds the main risks from using MDMA is death. And I think that's been devalued to some extent when people uh, compare the number of deaths from using ecstasy with the number of deaths from horse riding in various other sports and, and legitimate activities. I'd like to see the focus taken off death. I mean, clearly, tragically, a significant number of youngsters do die, um, but they die from lots of other things too. What I'm more concerned about is the subtle effects that these chemicals might have, which I don't think we have adequately conveyed to youngsters. We really are concerned about the consequences that, that, that the exposure to these compounds might have in, in the long term, and we don't understand them. There are groups of youngsters who shouldn't use MDMA under any circumstances. We know that anybody who has epilepsy uh, it, it would be very unwise to use it. Anybody with a heart condition would be very unwise to use it. Anybody who has any mental illness themselves or even in a close relative would probably be very unwise to use it. So perhaps we should concentrate on those who definitely shouldn't use it, but I still wouldn't say that the rest of the population is safe when they do use it. We still have this big question mark over the effects it has on them too. So do you think ease are dangerous? Yeah, or is well, it yeah, how you use them? It's how you use them, but essentially they are yeah. dangerous, but it's a decision you make. Crossing the road can be dangerous, but it's a decision you make. Mm. Do they sort of change your outlook? Change your attitude about anything? We change my attitude to pills, because at first off, I only had like a misinformed interpretation of them, which is basically because of the government and. Uh, so, so what, when you said misinformed, what, what did you think? Uh, well, basically, all you get is like it's drugs, it's bad, that kind of stuff. You take pills if you're gonna die, but I don't know. I had a really good time. Our parents, like us, our grandparents or whatever, you know, they think, oh, these kids have got it easy because we're not working in a factory when we're 13 or whatever, yeah? But we, like, have to put up with the pressure of people, you know, trying to get us to take brown and stuff with drugs. I mean, our parents couldn't contend for drugs, could they? They wouldn't know what to do. We know that MDMA tinkers with the brain in terms of its uh, serotonin use, and serotonin is involved in the control of mood and it's linked to uh, depressive illness. So the worry has to be that if we change the way the brain handles serotonin, we might predispose those people to some consequences of that. And the most likely consequences are, at the moment, to do with depression. But we don't know. No, we don't know.